Tell me what you know about the textile industry in North Carolina. What textile industry in North Carolina? We just don't have a textile industry anymore. There's none left. I mean, you can't find them anymore. Tell me what you know about the textile industry in North Carolina. It's gone. Gone. The textile industry in North Carolina, all gone. I'm Robert Shank Newton. I'm a documentary producer from Chapel Hill, and I was raised in a textile family, one that goes back six generations in textiles. In 2006, I noticed people beginning to say the textile industry in North Carolina was gone, completely gone. That shocked me, and I knew it wasn't true, but my own family's textile company was struggling and I wondered how many of the thousands of textile companies that once spread through every county in North Carolina were still left. Was it only a matter of time before the last company, sort of like the last woolly mammoth, became extinct? I kept talking to people, and one thing became clear about North Carolinians. We still had our opinions about things like the best beaches or the best barbecue, but in 2012, it became clear to me people had no idea what had happened to the single biggest industry the state had ever known. The textile industry built North Carolina and it made it possible for all of these little towns to spring up, people to have good jobs, and ultimately we had hundreds of thousands of jobs in this state. These names, once so familiar to every North Carolinian, are woven into the fabric of this state. Companies, which often became the very bedrock of towns, large and small. Charlotte, with its gleaming skyscrapers, was built on the banking industry. But the banking industry in Charlotte was built with textile money. The Dean Dome in Chapel Hill, indeed the entire UNC system, as well as our community colleges, would not have been built without the money made from textiles. The Greensboro Coliseum, you name it, the list goes on and on to the point one has to ask, what happened? How could an industry so vital to one state have simply disappeared? Or has it? In the next half hour, we'll try to find the answer to those questions. They say this industry has been dying a slow death now for years. Stowe Mill says it's winding down operations. A familiar headline, a familiar theme, especially between 1997 and 2005. Another textile company either closes or announces it's moving its operations out of North Carolina. For an industry built over a hundred year period, the unraveling was swift and brutal. All told, over 160,000 jobs disappeared. For many workers laid off, it was the last well-paying job with benefits they would see for a long time. Jim Fain was Secretary of Commerce during those challenging years. And it was clear to Governor Easley and to us in the Department of Commerce that uh, in many respects, uh, these represented changes in our economy for which there was no going back. The world many North Carolinians had come to take for granted, that of a stable, growing textile industry that anchored many large and small towns, was rapidly changing. Dan St. Louis, a textile veteran, saw the first hints of that change at a textile and apparel trade show called Magic in Las Vegas. A show so dominated by American textile and apparel companies, he recalls the first time he even noticed a foreign manufacturer there at the Sands Hotel. You know, we started seeing in 99, they had a little area at the bottom of the Sands, which was a few vendors from various countries. It was basically a, a table with some pipe and drape behind it. You know, it wasn't very sophisticated. Not very sophisticated. That was 1999. This is the same show in 2012.
St. Louis watched as foreign manufacturers took more and more of the U.S. market until finally... 2005, it was like the tsunami was, you know, the wave had built and we're standing there as an industry, we're looking up and saying, oh man, we're in trouble. One of the big companies swamped by that tsunami was Burlington Industries, which went bankrupt and was purchased in 2003 by one of the world's leading private equity investors, Wilbur Ross. With the exception of a few companies like Burlington, Ross believed the textile industry in the South was caught flat-footed and ill-prepared for globalization. The industry had 10 years' notice that the multi-fiber agreement would expire on December 31st, 2005, but very few of the companies did anything to adjust their business plan to reflect that certainty. The multi-fiber agreement was a restriction on the amount of foreign-produced textile products that could be sold in the U.S. Ross and others say the textile industry could have consolidated earlier and stemmed its losses. If this is all getting a bit business technical, there's an easy way to look at it. Back in the 90s, North Carolina had thousands of large and small textile companies scattered across the state. Each saw as their competition the guy down the street. They were all battling each other for a piece of the larger textile business. And because of that, a lot of them didn't see what was coming at them from overseas until it was too late. What it really boiled down to, though, is you better have a game plan. And that's what we're trying to get folks to do, look at it. You know, you got to have a game plan. How are you going to compete? And it's not just competing with your neighbor up the street. That's what we were used to. The closings continued in 2002 and 2003. Companies either moving their manufacturing operations overseas to try to stay in business or shutting down altogether, all of it at a faster and faster pace until the granddaddy of all North Carolina textile companies called it quits on July 30th. Pillotex workers were hoping for a miracle to save the troubled company and their jobs, but it didn't come. The company announced it was closing its door yesterday, putting thousands of workers out of a job. That was not an expected part of my day on the morning of July 30th. Although there had been rumors, the announcement hit the Easley administration like a thunderclap. Representatives from the Department of Commerce flew to Kannapolis immediately and found, I guess as my kids would say, uh, management had uh, left the building. It was the largest layoff in North Carolina history and it shook the state to its core. Combine that with five years of stories about mill closings and an idea began to take hold. That the once vaunted textile industry of North Carolina was no longer. People still working in the industry began to get asked the same question. For a while, I even believed that, you know, textiles were basically dead because I read the popular press. Dean Blanton Godfrey of the North Carolina State University College of Textiles says it was a notion that took root That's even right. among elected officials. One of our representatives, my first meeting with him, asked me if there's any textile industry left in North Carolina. In 2006, the state of North Carolina commissioned a study to answer that very question. Working with Dr. Nancy Castle and researchers at the NC State College of Textiles, the North Carolina Department of Commerce found that despite the closings, despite the massive layoffs, there remained over 1,400 textile or textile-related companies still operating in North Carolina. We were surprised to find not only manufacturing, which has been our core basis, but the activities in terms of the design, the development, the sourcing, the global trade. I need an order for a thousand of them. You give it to me and we'll give you a price on how much it would cost you to make it. In other words, a new, more diverse textile industry had emerged from the wreckage. But how? How did some textile companies defy the odds and the predictions of their own doom? To understand the answer, First, you need to understand a few basics about making clothes. Nearly all textile products are either knitted or woven. And the thread to make them, called yarn, has to be created from raw materials. 
There's a fourth technology, but we'll save that for later. Spinning cotton into yarn has been a business that many North Carolina companies have done for generations. But none quite like this. Parkdale Mills, headquartered in Gastonia, was founded by Duke Kembrell, one of the pioneers of the textile industry. Now run by Anderson Warlick, Duke's son-in-law, Parkdale has diversified in recent years with its purchase of U.S. cotton. But diversification was only one of the strategies Warlick adopted to keep his company going. For the dark years, when Parkdale had to shutter plants and Warlick had to let go friends, he recalls being tested as a new boss. The first time I ever had to lay anybody off and uh, the reaction I had personally made me question whether I was, I had what it takes to, to be in this business. Part of his learning curve as a CEO was realizing that the globalization of the textile market brought with it a new way of doing business. Duke used to be able to pick up the phone in bad times back in the 70s and call a buddy and say, hey, business is off, I need an extra truckload of yarn, and they'd take it away from some, another supplier because they had a relationship like that. Those relationships were going away. Though Parkdale has opened manufacturing plants in Honduras, it recently made a $50 million investment, the biggest in the company's history, just across the line in Gaffney, South Carolina. The phrase textile mill hardly seems adequate to describe one of the largest, most technologically advanced manufacturing facilities in the world. This plant raises efficiency to an art form. The 96.8 is the percent efficiency that we're currently running in spinning. Overseas spinning plants, the ones Parkdale competes with, typically run a little over 80% efficiency. This plant runs much higher. The efficiency numbers are tied to individual employees who are responsible for keeping those numbers high. It's people and machines that enable Parkdale to stay on top. Right now, we are the largest, so we're going to have people that are going to try to knock us off. But uh, with our service and our speed to market, we can overcome some of the lower cost operators uh, in other parts of the world, even against people who are paying 20 cents an hour. This is an important point. Almost every business school and nearly every economist will tell you it's impossible for a U.S. company to compete in the world of low-cost textiles, what are called commodity textiles. Parkdale helps prove just how wrong that mindset has been, the mindset that wrote off the textile business in the first place. Companies with too much debt probably are not going to survive. On a Saturday in Kannapolis, back in 2006, Tuscarora Yarn CEO Martin Foyle gave a speech about the state of the industry and the dangers of textile companies piling up debt. While he spoke, less than a mile away, demolition crews were ripping down the legendary Cannon Mills plant number two, making the same point a bit more dramatically. Foyle knows something about survival, having almost lost his own textile firm years earlier. I hit the wall. And yeah, I didn't think I'd make it for a while. And the light came on one day. I said, you know, we can't do this anymore. We cannot expand in this area. Tuscarora was making the same white yarn everyone else was, but it wasn't making money. To stay in business, Foyle realized he would have to specialize, and specialize he did. I changed my whole attitude about which way to drive the corporation. And so we drove it to a, a fancier market and, and basically in color. And what we've done is create color denim that's rarely ever seen in these kind of bright colors. In the green, color fast yarns were just coming into their own when Tuscarora made them a priority. This in turn has driven growth. Tuscarora opened a new mill in 2010, adding over 100 jobs. But the new textile jobs require each employee to understand the importance of getting the product out the door as quickly as possible. We can do all this in 24 hours. The world we live in today is different than the world we lived in 10 years ago. It's a 24-7 world. 
know, where we used to sell everything <laughs> within a probably five state radius. Today, 45% of our output goes overseas. That's one theme that most surviving textile companies have learned, some the hard way. Change is inevitable and necessary. Alan Gant got his company, Glen Raven, to embrace change. And he doesn't have a lot of sympathy for companies that won't. A lot of textile companies blame their failure on the fact that China or India has shipped very cheap goods in here. We spent a lot of time and energy saying we have been damaged by the rest of the world as opposed to using that money and that energy reinventing ourselves. Glen Raven reinvented itself when it got out of the hosiery business years ago and developed a uniquely innovative textile product, Sunbrella. Used around the world in awnings, outdoor furniture, and marine applications, Sunbrella fabric does not fade or degrade even after years outdoors. Though Sunbrella has been wildly successful for Glen Raven, Gantz says he has no plans to settle in and only produce textile products. We have the ability to change fairly dramatically, fairly quickly, and in fact, if we don't reinvent this company every three to five years, then we are loafing, and uh, we just that's just that's just part of our culture, it's part of our being. Sixteen years ago, when Glen Raven was busy reinventing itself, they sold their entire hosiery yarn business in Norlina to Unify. They sold the business, but they kept the building and its employees, converting the operation to the spinning of high-tech yarns that make Sunbrella. Keeping the employees was risky. After all, most had only ever worked with one kind of technology. Plus, there was another idea I heard whispered over and over again while growing up in the textile business. That is, that you couldn't retrain an old line textile worker. It was better just to let them go and build a new workforce when you switch technologies. I've been in the textile business actually about 30, about 39 years total. Melvin Hargrove is one of those old line textile workers people used to whisper about. As a manager with Glen Raven, it was his job to adapt to the new technologies and to get his fellow employees to follow. It was not easy. I will not sit here and tell you it was easy. People, employees, they don't embrace change at first. There was some resistance, but Hargrove says most employees saw the writing on the wall and eventually did embrace it as an opportunity. Alan Gant says he never doubted they could make the change. Because those employees were some of the most innovative people we had ever run across. In nine months, we completely retooled that plant, retrained all the employees, put them back to work. I would say 75, 80 percent of our people had never been through a process like this or had never seen ring spin. And, and people just did a heck of a job in transitioning from where we went to to where we are today. Who can forget this iconic scene from the movie Norma Ray? Sally Field refusing to leave the mill where she's trying to organize a union. For many Americans, this movie was their only window into the world of southern textile mills, and it was not a pretty one. To be sure, there have been cases of maltreatment of workers in mills, as there have been in every industry. But the fact is that the week in 1979, when Norma Ray was released, employees at Acme McCrary in Ashboro were taking a swim in their company pool. They're still swimming in that same pool. We've got an indoor swimming pool, and we've got uh, weight rooms, and we've got activity rooms. CEO Bill Redding says wellness and health care for its employees are values ingrained in the culture at Acme McCrary. We believe in wellness. Uh, we're one of the pioneers. We actually started it in 92, before it was even fashionable to be into the wellness business. Every U.S. employee in this company has health care, and every facility has a health clinic. It's not exactly Norma Ray. Our heritage, the company always believed in treating people fairly and paying them fairly. In researching this story, I found that by and large, the textile companies which have survived in this business climate have not been the ones who raced to the bottom in terms of pay and benefits. 
but rather the ones that have managed those costs most efficiently. This is a footless body shaping pantyhose that we manufacture for Spanx. Spanx is just one of the noteworthy brands that Acme McCrary produces. The company now ships about a million pair of hosiery a week. So many, they've expanded into a 400,000 square foot facility in Siler City, adding jobs in the process. The making of hosiery and underwear remain a bright spot, with giants of the industry still dotting the North Carolina landscape. Firms like Haynes, Kaiser Roth, and Holt continue to thrive. But if you look beyond the titans, it's easy to see the future of textiles in people like Rachel Weeks. I wanted to start a collegiate apparel lifestyle brand, and I wanted to start something really design-driven, but one that also honored the, um, the craft and the artistry of making beautiful garments. Weeks founded her apparel company, Schoolhouse, after graduating Duke. She spent a year establishing a manufacturing base for her products in Sri Lanka one which paid living wages in a country not known for it. But Weeks found herself a victim of her own success. We had gotten to a place where we were competing for factory space with some very large clients. Um, and we put our heads together and started doing some hunting around the U.S. and primarily North Carolina and found some gems that, you know, we just had no idea. I mean, I spent four years at Duke and had no idea there was a factory, you know, five minutes down the road making garments. Tyler Bennett and a business partner purchased Mitt's Knits in 2009 as they began to see a tidal shift in overseas manufacturing. When we also had been doing some manufacturing like Rachel overseas in the Far East. We were kind of seeing the same thing. A lot of the labor costs were going up, the turnaround time, the shipping time that it took uh, to ship the goods back. But purchasing an older manufacturing facility didn't come without second thoughts. Well, hey, would we be crazy if we started uh, looking into buying manufacturing or a manufacturing plant here in the United States? As they slowly broadened their client base over the next year, they realized it wasn't crazy at all. In fact, their gamble was going to pay off. Then Rachel Weeks walked in with an offer, a modern approach to the relationship between vendor and client. We see this as a partnership, even though you know we're buying finished goods from them, and that part of it is you know a pretty traditional sort of relationship. Um, every decision is one that we want to make together so that everybody succeeds. Corner and look, this is the one that we're knitting down for the V-neck sweaters. For us, made in America means a higher quality. It means you know 21st century approach to design, and um, and so I think that in terms of being competitive, you have to align that vision, especially with your partners. Small success stories like Rachel's and Mitt's Knits are starting to pop up like green shoots all over North Carolina. In June 2010, a textile company about to reopen a plant in Gastonia held a job fair which drew hundreds of job seekers. Well, I'm glad textiles is coming back. We feel very fortunate to be able to open the house plant Despite the recession, there's actually a sense of optimism in the air. Even the media have begun to take notice. If you want to find one place where the optimism never quite failed, it would be here, on the campus of the College of Textiles at NC State University. For the class of 2012 is graduating, and... It was our biggest graduation ever. 296 students, not to mention their parents, had enough confidence in the health of the apparel and textile industries that they were willing to bet their futures on it. This wasn't always the case, though. There was a time, not too many years ago, when students also bought into the idea that textiles were finished. Sometimes when they go home and tell mom and dad they want to go to the College of Textiles, mom and dad says, talk to Uncle Bill. He got laid off two years ago and hadn't found a job since, you know. There's no future in textiles. This 112-year-old institution had a problem. It was widely recognized as a leader in areas such as flame retardants, polymers, and technical textiles, as well as training the next generation of engineers and managers for the manufacturing sector. But as manufacturing dwindled, so did enrollment. 
we had a decline for several years. And our academic dean just drew the line and he, he, he pointed to the faculty in one of the internal meetings we had. He says, we're going to be out of business in so many years. It was a wake-up call, the same wake-up call the industry was getting. The college knew it had to do something, and fast. Instead of hunkering down and playing defense, they took some bold steps, one of which was to expand the curriculum, offering something for students more interested in the world of fashion, the design, merchandising, and marketing of clothes, as opposed to simply textiles. In return, students began to take a second look, and enrollment increased. But enrollment was only half of the equation. Um, last year, our industry generated a little over $6.6 billion. We've had to reach out to companies that are more what we call the downstream, the retail, the import, the marketers, and, and share with them not only our programs, but invite them to come into our college. It's one thing to invite companies. It's another for them to show up. The proof would come on career day. If even a handful of recruiters showed up in the midst of the recession, that would vindicate much of the college's efforts. Businesses and recruiters showed up in droves. So many it was hard to find space for them. Just as importantly, it showed the textile business and the apparel business still believed in their own future. A glimpse of that future lies in a nondescript lab behind a series of locked doors on campus. It's a lab like nothing you've ever seen. When you make a surgical gown that costs less than 10 cents for the entire fabric, you can't ever do that with a woven fabric. Remember we said there were two primary methods for making fabric. Well, there's a third method. Unlike knitting and weaving, fiber is literally sprayed into the form of a web. Those webs are then pressed together to make cloth. It's called non-woven fabric, and it's been around for years, though most people don't realize it. Non-wovens were so cheap, the products made from them were typically disposable. But that's changing due partly to research done here at NC State. We can make non-wovens to be reusable. We can make them to be launderable. We can make them compete with existing woven fabrics that go into everyday use. Most importantly, they can make them right here in North Carolina, and they do. This has really become the hub for companies that want to make non-wovens. And we are the largest in terms of percentage in the U.S., and that continues to be the case. North Carolina, the largest producer of non-woven textiles. How many people knew that? In the end, though, it's not about being the largest or the most technologically advanced. It's about a spirit of entrepreneurship that built the great textile industry of the South, which in turn helped to build the great state of North Carolina. And the future of that great spirit couldn't be represented any more clearly than in two pairs of entrepreneurs, one pair in Weaverville and the other 187 miles away in Mount Gilead. One new mill, one very old. Julie Jensen, a lawyer by training wanted to get back to her roots in farming and weaving natural fibers. She bought some land in Weaverville and built a state-of-the-art natural fiber processing facility she calls EchoView. Only problem, Julie knew little about running a textile mill, so the first person she hired was Gwen Perkins. She has that textile background um, that I don't have. Textiles has always been my hobby. Uh, in addition to my vocation. Perkins would need both aspects of her experience to learn the ins and outs of getting fiber from the alpaca to the skein, since Echoview would be one of the only natural fiber mills on the East Coast. It's a very unique business, and there are so many variables, uh, regardless of which end of it you're in, whether you're in vegetable fibers or animal fibers or, you know, knitting, weaving, whatever. It's extremely complex and there are a lot of variables and you can learn something every single day. Um, part of what we want to do is teach other people um, about textiles and where your clothes come from so that people can make a good decision. 
while Echoview, with its glass and steel design, is fast becoming a landmark near Asheville, down in Montgomery County, most drive past this old service station without even noticing it. Do you consider yourself a textile mill? Sure. Don't you think so? Joyce Sedbury and Marty Richardson became textile entrepreneurs, not so much from desire, but more out of necessity when the mill they worked at closed down. We couldn't get a job anywhere else, you know, we were uh, older. And for some reason we just sat and talked about it. After talking, they got themselves a couple of World War II era knitting machines and started doing the only thing they knew how to do, knit socks. Their business plan? Marty put one on eBay and people would bid on it. Sometimes they would go as much as what? $10 a pair for it. Just for us on knee high. So they squeezed into this old gas station and with help from Marty's daughter, Emily, they built themselves a business knitting socks one sock every nine minutes. But that's all it took to make a living for the two of them, and that's all they were after. They use these little, the, they're called pattern jacks, and you can see the pattern in there. Could you have more business if you wanted it? Yes. You can't handle any more. <laughs> like the biggest textile corporations, the ones still standing, these two textile executives managed to find a way to keep their company going, one sock at a time. It's in our blood, just knitting socks, and you know, we're just happy just to be working, you know? It's in our blood. Perhaps no other sentiment captures the reason North Carolina maintains such a strong presence in the textile industry, despite all the closings and all the layoffs. Textiles is what we know in this state. It's what we're good at. And in case you were still wondering about the textile industry, yes, it's still standing.